Christmas, everybody. Good to see you. Daryl got the memo here. <clears throat> I said, wear that jacket. He said, okay, no. Um, thank you for being here this weekend. Man, uh, I love it. cold weather. Anybody with me? All right. It's a break. I'm enjoying every moment of it because in six months I'll be complaining about the heat. And I'm going to remember back to this this week that we've been experiencing cold mornings, cold nights, and uh, it feels good. It feels nice. But who wants some good news out there? Yeah? I got to tell you, because this has been a great week for us as a community and just for me as a grandfather, because I have a new grandbaby, all right, that I want to show off to you. I want you to meet Cohen. Oh, this is little Cohen. Um, he was born last Friday around 7 p.m. right in the middle of the Polar Express, right? Of course. Uh, he weighed 8 pounds, 6 ounces, and I believe he was 21 inches, all right? Give him a shout out, all right? Kirsten obviously is home with him. Zion is here, so make sure you let him know. Congratulations. But I have to show you another picture because when we got to take Maddox and show him I'm Cohen for the first time, I want to show you this. This is the first time getting to meet his little brother. It was great. And he looks over at Kirsten and he says, uh, go away, Mama, because um, he wanted to be in control of Cohen. And she's like, are you going to feed him? You know what I'm saying? Um, but that's such an amazing gift. If you get the chance somewhere in this season to hold a, a newborn or a little one so special. Um, and for us at our house, it's been such a beautiful week of getting a chance. Every time I get the chance to see him, I ask Kirsten today at lunch, can I hold him for a little bit? Because it just reminds me of the beauty of life. Amen. Amen. And I also want to celebrate this community because last weekend we did something um, unheard of in these times, especially during this season for us uh, in our culture and in the East Valley. Um, I'm so thankful for a church that believed and got behind the message of the Polar Express. Amen. A huge shout out. Come on, let's give a huge shout out to all those who helped. Back in January, we just felt like there was something in our spirit that said we're going to need to respond um, with a message of hope. And so we changed from the Grinch, brand new production, and not the best and craziest time of year uh, to change things, but we did anyways, and just uh, just gave a huge shout out to Zion and said, right, and he wrote a script, combined the movie and the book, uh, something comforting that people would recognize, uh, but last weekend with social distancing, with sanitation, with the best that we could do to make sure that people were safe, um, we had, I mean, capacity at each performance, on Sunday specifically, and the beauty was just watching people find hope again. Um, I hit somebody in the hallway, and didn't hit them, but I hit a, um, we connected, and um, they had lost a, a child in, in the past uh, few years, and he was just broken down and just said, thank you for sharing this message this weekend, because it reminded me that there is hope no matter what. Um, and I just want to say thank you again for supporting financially, prayerfully, spiritually. So many of you hosted, you were here, the cast. I mean, it was a beautiful weekend. And I'll leave you with this final thought on it is, you know, I, I didn't think about this until I saw it happen. As we were standing in line and you got, hopefully you got a chance to meet our real deal Santa Claus, right? Real beard and everything. Um, um, but behind the social distancing, he was taking kids, uh, pictures with the kids. And um, there was a family that brought their blind son. Um, that was seeing impaired. And I just was so moved that um, he came and stood in line and we were talking and um, the mom just said, thank you for presenting just the gospel so that he could hear it. And I thought of that on Saturday night. I went home and I went, you know, I'm so thankful for the tech team and how hard we had to work. I mean, there's like 11 mics. I mean, it was crazy. And, and we did the best job we could, but I'm so thankful we worked hard because he couldn't see it but he could hear the message, the message of hope, the message of believing. And you help make that happen in whatever capacity you were able to give, to pray, to be a part. And I'm just thankful for a community. And she, this is what the mom said. She said, thank you. When he's here and he, he just is able to listen and hear the message, it just brings him joy. And I'm like, that's what it's all about. Amen. So everybody say challenge. I have a challenge for you. We have the giving tree out there, 
and most often in communities, um, you know, we, we tend to think that somebody else is going to take care of somebody else and somebody else will take care of somebody else. And we forget that God has put us on the planet to do something. Now, we can't do everything, but we can do, everybody say something. We can do something. So we've got about 40 ornaments on that tree. Now, I was challenged this week because I got a phone call because originally we made 40, and somebody who doesn't even go to our community, who isn't even connected with our community, but is connected with Brenda and I from the past, called me and said, hey, we're trying to teach our three boys how to give. They're younger, between the ages of like three and, and six, and we want to, to take on a project. Do you have something that we could do? And I said, well, we have this giving tree. Blah, blah, blah. We have 40 ornaments. You can just take a couple of those. And she said, I want all 40. I want all 40. And I said, well, we've got to come up then with 40 more. <laughs> and she said, well, I'll leave that to you. You're a genius. Um, I said, okay. So we came up with 40 more gifts for this beautiful Ohana home uh, that we've got one of our uh, young adults, uh, newlywed, that works there. Taylor works there. And we're going to help those girls have a beautiful Christmas because they don't have maybe what you've had. So let's do it for them. So... She, my friend's going to take care of um, the stockings. And I said, then let's take care of the gifts. We have hands out that Trish and Jake help lead. Um, socks, simple things. Take something off it and then bring it back. It takes you five minutes at Walmart. You know, skip having a $7 drink this week. I mean, at Jeremiah's, yes. Um, at Starbucks, no. Okay. We won't pay the man anymore. <laughs> um, but pick something up. You don't have to spend a lot. But get out there and do something. Because that is the spirit of the season, and Christ has done it for us. Amen. Let's pray, Lord. Open our hearts tonight and help us to realize this weekend that we can do something. We simply just have to be willing. And so I just pray that not only would we be able to be a part of the giving tree and, and be connected to helping Christmas be brighter and more hopeful for somebody, but this is just a part of the good news that we get to share every day, every second because of what you've done for us. So open our hearts this weekend again, that this isn't just another Christmas that we hear the same story over and over and think, yeah, it's just Christmas. Oh, I pray you'd pierce our hearts and change us, God, so that we are really understanding the power of what it truly means to celebrate the season. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give Jesus a shout. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to end with a little story time, so I want to get there. But before we get there, um, I want to share a few things in between. Is that okay? Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Now, we started this Christmas series a few weeks ago, and actually a few years ago. The, I think the battle started with Christmas, and I think it's continuing on no matter where you go. Um, people say Happy Holidays. Some people say Merry Christmas. Um, but we talked about the idea, can you imagine if we took Christmas, the word, out of the equation, and we just became a culture of a holiday. And we looked at what that would look like. And that was an inspiration for me in writing that short story, The Holiday Tree. And um, it's a, a short story about this idea in this little town where they just take away the meaning of Christmas and just give gifts and bake great goods and celebrate trees that light up, but they forget the reason why. And I think in our culture, we can easily forget the reason why. We need a message of peace and hope and redemption now more than ever. And so um, this year, what we wanted to do is remind you in a very shaky, a very uncertain year that there are some traditions that are unshakable and a part of the season that we can't forget about. And so we looked at the first week that Christmas is prophetic. Everybody say prophecy. We looked at this idea of prophecy, and what does it even mean? And that there are over 300 prophetic words in the Old Testament that lead us to the New Testament, and Jesus coming into the world, and all of them um, coming to pass. And the odds of that are like one in 45 kabillion, right? We looked at what that would really take. This is our God, and if he can do that, then he can do whatever you need in your life as you surrender to him, that he is that kind of a God. Now, last weekend, we had the Polar Express, but if you were online with us, let's give our online community a huge shout-out, right? Um, if you were online, we had uh, week two, and we looked at, everybody say promise. 
the promise. And what that means, and what, and what, did, what were we promised in Isaiah? Uh, what does it mean to, for God to be our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father and prince of peace, when he sent his son in the form of a baby? What does that look like? And so get online and listen to that message. It's short. It's sweet. I'm wearing a Kermit the Frog shirt. I mean, I do Kermit the Frog interpretation. It's awesome. So if you get a chance, you can listen to that. And tonight we're going to be talking about the good news, because this weekend I want you to know Christmas is good news, right? And who can share it best for us but, of course, Linus from the Charlie Brown Christmas special. You'll love this. Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Such a good message. Now, I learned some trivia this week that I didn't know, but in that particular clip, I don't know if you noticed it, but Linus drops his blanket at a particular point, and it's when he says the word, fear not. Now, if you know this, Charles Schultz put that in there because uh, that was, obviously, the blanket was Linus's security. So when he reads the words, fear not, he drops the blanket because his security isn't in the blanket. His security is in our God, right? And that's why you see his little hands, and he goes through and continues on with the story. Um, and uh, I love that that is a simple illustration for us because the word fear not or the words fear not are in Scripture over 365 times. And I love it because that uh, hits us once for every day of the year. Amen, right? <laughs> And I love it that Linus let go and looked to a stronger source for his foundation. That is good news. And in Luke 2, 8 to 20, I want to revisit what Linus said. And I want to read it to you. Um, and I want you just to be so, uh, so hungry for what God can speak to you out of a story that most of you have heard maybe hundreds of times, uh, maybe a few times. But nonetheless, you've probably heard it before. And out of Luke this is what's written about when Jesus comes to the earth. The night, that, the night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. Anybody else? I would be. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring joy to all the people. Verse 11. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign, you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in the manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. So they hurried off to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby. There was the prophecy fulfilled lying in the manger. Verse 17. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened. Important, because we're going to talk about that. They didn't keep it a secret. And what the angel had said to them about this child. 18. All um, who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel told them. Amen? So what on earth is the good 
news. Maybe you're, maybe you're sitting here, maybe you're on your couch at home, and you're like, okay, well, what are you talking about, Mark? I'm talking about the obvious, but it's right in front of us. Salvation. Oh, yeah. All right. Come on, somebody. I mean, salvation, and I gave it 22 exclamation points on my notes because it's easy to allow salvation to just be part of the Christian gig. Now, we're reminded of salvation. Usually at Easter, everybody gets super spiritual, right? We're reminded of the cross, what, what Jesus went through. And for some reason at Christmas, we can easily forget that this was the entry point for the 33 years that our Savior would be on this earth to redeem us, right? And what is the good news? Well, the good news for the shepherds was this, to a generation that had been slaughtering lambs for generations to pay the penalty of sin, this news was more than good, right? Yeah. Have you ever had a chance to relearn or redeem something in your life that wasn't going so well because of maybe your lack of education or opportunity, and then something changes everything? Anybody been through this before? Everybody say, uh-huh. uh-huh. That aha uh-huh mama, mama moment, or maha mama, or the maha mama. Um, now, let me give you an example that we've talked about before, but I want to point out, I saw them here earlier. Sam and Dee, where you guys are, you're here somewhere, right? Now, they had an aha uh-huh financial moment because a few years ago, they were nearly $100,000 in debt. Am I correct? 90 something, right? Um, it wasn't just like $10. I mean, this was a lot. Um, this is student loans, a few cards, a trip to Tahiti. I mean, they, they had financed a lot. Um, and so they start going through Financial Peace University, and they start to honor God with their finances, and they start to learn how to pay off debt. And they now, today, sitting here, are debt-free because of the education. Amen, right? Everybody say good news. news. Is that not good news? Because I'm telling you, that's good news for them and good news for their family. And everything changed because suddenly they realized how amazing it is. And the good news to the shepherds was this. Look. This one you've been hearing about, this Messiah, these 300 prophecies that the Old Testament is telling us about, that that this Messiah is going to save us. He's here, and he's going to save us from heartache. He is here. And, And it did. It benefited them because now it's still benefiting us, right? Because the veil was torn, and no longer do we have to go through someone to get to God. But now we, his kids, have access to him whenever we call on his name. That is good news. And in the New Testament, the name of the Lord uh, is Jesus. And Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that is good news, right? We just have to confess it. We give opportunity every week, and we're going to have that opportunity again tonight to rededicate, to give your life to the Lord, because that is the good news of the gospel of what Jesus said. And in Romans 10, 11 to 13, in the message translation, it's written, Scripture reassures us, no one who trusts God like this, heart and soul, will ever regret it. It's exactly the same, no matter what a person's religious background may be. The same God for all of us, acting the same incredibly generous way to everyone who calls out for help. Everyone who calls help God gets help. That is good news, all right? Because sometimes I've called out help wherever I'm at, and nobody's helped me. You know what I'm saying? And when we call out to God, he doesn't go, well, let me, let me see if I've got a few minutes for you. The good news is he is there already before us, behind us, and in the moment with us. And I love it. I mean, think about this idea. I mean, strength and courage, it's in us when we ask for it. And you may not always see it in the exact moment that, that you think you need to see it. But if we call on it, God is faithful to bring it. And the psalmist David understood this. And I've been reading through the psalms out of the message paraphrase um, in, in this month, in this kind of season of Advent, to remind myself of David's heart cry for the father. Um, because that father had a heart cry for his people when he sent his son. And in Psalm 18, long before the son of God came into our world, David 
gets like this moment where he just journals and writes down about the good news. And he sings this song to God, and he sings that after being saved from his enemies, particularly he had been chased by King Saul and was nearly killed, but God saved him, and this is what he writes. And I want you to give a shout-out. Daryl, you ready for this? I want you to give a shout-out if any of these things uh, maybe kind of you know resonate in your life or you've experienced them before. Are you ready? Here we go. I want to read it, hoping to read it like he would have written it. I love you, God. You make me strong. God is a bedrock under my feet, the castle in which I live, my rescuing night. My God, the high crag where I run for dear life, hiding behind the boulders safe in the granite hideout. The hangman's noose was tight at my throat. Devil waters rushed over me. Hell's ropes cinched me tight. Anybody identify... Death traps barred every exit, but me he caught, reached all the way from sky to sea. He pulled me out of that ocean of hate, that enemy chaos, that void in which I was drowning. They hit me when I was down, but God stuck by me. He stood me up on a wide open field, stood there saved, surprised to be loved. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. When I got my act together, he gave me a fresh start. Now I'm alert to God's ways. I don't take for granted. Every day I review the way he works. I try not to miss a trick. I feel put back together. I'm watching my step. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. And then he says this, is there any God like God? Are, are we not a, a bedrock? Is not this God the one who armed me, then aimed me in the right direction? Now I run like a deer. I'm king of the mountain. He shows me how to fight. I can bend a bronze bow. Yeah, anybody want to bend a bronze bow? He, you protect me with salvation armor. You hold me up with a firm hand. You caress me with your gentle ways. You cleared the ground underneath me so my footing was firm. When I was chased by my enemies, I caught them. I didn't let go till they were dead men. I nailed them. They were down for good. Then I walked all over them. These boots were made for walking, right? Okay. Anyways, okay. You armed me well for this fight. You smashed the upstarts. You made my enemies turn tail, and I wiped them, uh, and I wiped out the haters. They cried uncle, but uncle didn't come. Oh, yeah. They yelled for God and got no for an answer. I ground them to dust. They gusted in the wind. I threw them out like garbage in the gutter. I sing to God the praise lofty and find myself safe and saved. And then he ends this and says, Oh, a hostile world, I call to God. I cry to God to help me. From his palace, he hears my call. My cry brings me right into his presence, a private audience. That's some good words. That's some good news. Because what? Anybody else um, find that God is a rescuing knight? What did he rescue you from? I, I, I'm telling you, he rescued me from me because I was headed on a wrong direction. And every, you know, I still get in that, that opportunity where I can lead, be led into darkness. And he rescues me like a shining knight. He reached me, uh, he reached down to me all the way from the sky and, and he made my life complete. I mean, you go through this. This is the good news. And this week, Pastor Rob Ketterling from River Valley Church in Minneapolis, he shared this tweet that I thought was worth reading this weekend. And this is a Gallup poll, my friends. And a Gallup poll found out what? They, they're a polling firm. Um, they're not uh, religiously based. That would be the Barner Group. But this is a non-religious based polling firm. And they, they, they decided to just look at the mental health of Americans. And here's the hard part, is that the rating for Americans right now is down to 34% of people saying, I'm, I, I'm, I'm mentally there, I've, I'm good, I'm healthy. And last year it was 43%. So we're seeing a deficit um, in Americans saying in the last 9, 10 months that I'm mentally okay. I mean, this is what, what we call the struggle of depression, oppression, and we haven't seen this low of a mental health um, percentage since the Great Recession. And this is what we learn. The only uptick in that poll was what? They did all races. They did all socioeconomic backgrounds. The only individuals that said that they were mentally 
um, moving in the right direction and healthy was consistent churchgoers. And this is, what, this is what was written. This is what Rob says. He says, wow, the only demographic that is saying their mental health is better this year over last year is those going to church on a weekly basis. This is a mental health crisis, and churches need to open up to a greater degree, all right? And I am thankful that we are here this weekend, whether we're online or whether we're in person. I'm thankful that we are here because guess what? Because you're here, that means that your mental health is probably uh, on an upswing rather than a down. And seriously, if you look at this and you break down this article, it says that consistent. Now, not those that go like every now and then. Some of us, you know, we, we, we go to church like, you know, once a month. Yeah, that's my church. Or once a year, that's where I go. I'm talking, th- these are churchgoers that are like, we're in it to win it. Whether we're online or we're in person. But we're going to make sure that every week we're getting community. Because guess what? The way that God designed us is that we need each other. This is the mental health of wholeness, my friends. Community matters. Church community matters. Online or in person. And I am begging and I'm telling you and I'm speaking to you, stay connected. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how afraid you might get, that's why we have online and that's why we have in person. But don't get isolated. Because that's where the enemy comes in to steal, kill, and destroy our mental health. Stay connected. This, my friends, I thought was good news. And here's the heartbreaking thing. I've had, I've had just so many people in the last year, I've heard this breaking down of the church and the body. This, this idea of I don't need church or I'm tired of the Western church or I'm tired of church. And I'm saying this, we don't got a perfect church. And if this church isn't the right church, that's okay. But find a church, find a community. It's so important to your mental health. Why are we tearing apart the church when it's the one thing that can bring us together? So we've got to make a decision. It's not always going to go the way we want. We're not always going to agree with everybody. But one thing we can agree on is that Jesus can lead us in unity and Jesus can lead us to wholeness and health. Because when we're together in his presence, I mean, the way maker moves and God can do the impossible. So to me, that is good news. So if somebody ever asks you, well, what do you mean the good news? You, can, you got a lot to tell them. All right. Why the shepherds? Somebody say why. Why Why the shepherds? I don't know. (laughs) Um, When I was a kid, I wanted to be the shepherd, right? In the Christmas production, why did I want to be the shepherd? Because they didn't have any lines. They just (laughs) held sheep, right? (laughs) Joseph and Mary had all the lines. You know, one of the wise men had a line. But the shepherds, we just got to stand there. You know what I mean? It was the best. This is why I wanted to be a shepherd. And if you go back to Luke 2, 8, I mean, these guys are in a field, they're hanging out, the light shines, and heaven opens up. And two things about shepherds in this story you need to know is, one, I believe that God chose the shepherds because they definitely represent humanity, right? Why do they represent humanity? Because they were at the low end of culture at that time in the marketplace. And the fact that God chose to speak to them first is a huge indication that he views every human being the same. He didn't just go to the green room of earth, right? He didn't just go to the mega on earth. He didn't just go to those that, you know, have a billion dollars, but he went to those that don't have much at all. And he said, I'm going to give you the greatest message of all. The Savior is coming to earth, all right? So that's the first thing, because the shepherds represent you and me. Maybe that's why the shepherds and Secondly, I think the shepherds, as we read about in Luke, were possibly fulfilling temple duties. And what does this mean? It means that they were the only ones that could perform these specific duties so that possibly they were priests at the time or that they were working with priests. Um, The Misna is a group of documents that are are recorded, and it's the oral traditions that govern the Jewish people during the time of the Pharisees. And in in these particular documents, it states um, that the flocks needed to be kept close to the temple because those were the lambs that would be sacrificed for the sins of man. And so these shepherds were in the fields surrounding Bethlehem, not out in the wilderness where all the other sheep were, but these were in particular special sheep, we'll say. Um, so they must have been like, like being taken care of um, by somebody from the temple. And so that's why many believe, many theologians also believe that they, they could have been priests assigned to this particular duty. 
What really matters in particular, either way, is the shepherds are characters in a story um, that appreciated hearing about the Messiah for this reason. They no longer needed to slaughter the lambs to cover the sin. And that may, that may be like, what are you talking about slaughtering, Pastor Mark? This is Christmas. Can you talk about another subject, right? That's Easter. But this is the truth. I mean, these lambs were being raised to be slaughtered. And let's not underestimate the task. I, wanna, I want you to think about this for, for a few moments this weekend. Taking the life of an animal, I mean, isn't on most people's list of awesome opportunities. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we got some hunters in the room. I mean, I get it. I, I had a hamburger today. Somewhere something's dying. You know what I'm saying? I'm a meat eater. Let's hear it for all the vegans, okay? I get it. I see you. I hear you. But let's not underestimate the task of doing this. This was not the funnest job, all right? The process wasn't pretty. Lambs would be raised to perfection. No blemishes, cuts, or deformities. I love little puppies. I mean, little lambs. Can you imagine? Each lamb was selected. And here's the process. I mean, the sensory overload as a human being to do this was an experience. Um, probably violent resistance on the animal. The spurting of blood. The feel of the pulling the animal apart. The smell of its burning flesh and bones. I mean, imagine the emotional and spiritual impact of the offering and the sacrifice knowing that it was your sin that made the death necessary. And imagine the frustration of knowing that you'll probably be back tomorrow or next week because the sins will rise again in the people and in the community that you live in, and you'll be back slaughtering the lamb. I'm telling you, it was good news that Christ came because no longer did they have to slaughter the lamb because the lamb was in the manger and he, in 33 years, would give his life so no longer did we have to do these, these tasks to be free. I mean, there's so much depth in what Christ has done and why this is an important message for you to understand and understand that Christmas opens up what is to come in the life of our Savior. Because here's the truth, is I think maybe God chose the shepherds to hear the good news to remind us that we are all like sheep and we have all gone astray. Maybe the shepherds aren't just to be the, the three guys in the background that don't have any lines. Maybe they represent something deeper because in their hands are a symbol over 300 times in the, in the Bible that we as humans are likened to sheep. I mean, think of the comparisons. God chose to use the word sheep to identify his followers because we are his sheep. Our shepherd Jesus is leading our way, and think of the references, and I think of, okay, God, could you have, like, chosen another animal, right? The swiftness of a tiger. Could we have been, like, looked at as tigers as humans, right? With the speed of a cheetah, you know? <laughs> Why not something more graceful and valued? Maybe, like, you know, a giraffe or a prized bird. <laughs> but, but sheep, for Pete's sake, right? The other night I was over, uh, and Maddox and I, we were putting him, him to bed. Brenda and I were, and, and we were reading this book that Zion gave us, and it's got all these, like, exotic animals. And he was getting up on his bed, and he was showing me the sounds that they all make. He was doing a penguin. <laughs> and he was roaring. And I was thinking about this idea of a sheep, you know? I mean, because, like, couldn't, couldn't God have utilized the example of a lion? Roar! Right? That's awesome. Or a rhino's grunt. Have you ever heard a rhino grunt? <laughs> Good rhino, right? <laughs> Have you ever heard a moose scream? <laughs> I mean, that's powerful, right? It's so powerful. I mean, have you ever heard a horse neigh, you know? <laughs> Amazing, right? Or even a dog bark. <laughs> I mean, but this is what we are likened to. <laughs> this is what God likens us to. Sheep? I'm like, really, God? Are you serious? And there's some simple facts about sheep that uh, I started to read through again and reminding myself of this, that sheep aren't the most intelligent animals, right? We know this. 
They're susceptible to wander off. Um, you know, sheep respond to a shepherd's voice. We know that to be true. Um, the voice of the shepherd in John 10, 27, that's a good thing. But we also know that sheep can be very directionless, right? And they easily get, everybody say, lost. lost. And we know this. And Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we like sheep, we read that, have gone astray. And that's the truth of sheep. They easily get mm, lost, right? <laughs> Sheep are weak, and, and they need a shepherd. And I think it definitely likens us that people are spiritually weak, and we need a shepherd. Sheep are restless. If you've ever been around sheep, they're always moving. And the two major reasons is because of hunger and bugs, right? I mean, they can graze for hours, um, but in a moment, um, they get restless when food becomes scarce, and they get afraid, like we do. And in bugs, I mean, these things will land in their eyes and their ears, and it's a constant job of a, of a shepherd um, to constantly clean those things out. And it makes them restless. Sheep are, sheep are a personal prized possession of the shepherd. This is another fact that shepherds personally, back especially in the time of, of when, when we're reading about in the New Testament, I mean, shepherds personally bought these sheep. I mean, these were something that they've paid for. This was a personal price to own the sheep. Sheep need plenty of water, and definitely we need plenty of water, right? And not just water to drink, but we need the living water, right, as sheep. And too often we find ourselves uh, uh, being famished from it or keeping ourselves from it. And then on the inside, we're dying. Sheep follow the voice of their own shepherd and no other shepherd. One thing you got to know about sheep is once they hear the voice of the shepherd, and in, in back in those days when, when shepherds would sing, they would come up with calls. Those sheep would know that, and that's the direction that they would go. And, and the fact that I think just blew my mind even more is that sheep struggle to get up on their own. And if you're over 50 years of age, you get that, all right? Um, there's an English shepherd's term called cast down. And it simply means that um, uh, it, when, a sh when, when a sheep was cast down, it means that it was pathetic um, and it was weak and that usually it was lying on its back. Somehow it fell, um, maybe hurt one of its legs. And because of the size, um, many times can't even turn himself around and without the help of the she a shepherd could literally die. I mean, this is the problem. Sheep struggle to get up on their own and I think humans do as well, right? And one thing we know about sheep is when one becomes maimed or crippled for whatever reason, it's usually forgotten about by the other sheep or it's cast aside. And what's the good news in all this? The good news is this, is that God didn't have to do this. He could have done it another way, but he, he uses shepherds to be a symbolic picture for us. That Jesus came for the broken, the sheep without a shepherd, like me and you. And although the shepherds in the story are a key part of God's plan, I think maybe we identify more as the sheep that the baby in the manger would die for 33 years later. When my kids were little, we bought a storybook every year, and we still do it the grandkids now, and a book that we bought early on was by Max Lucado, and it's called The Crippled Lamb, and it's about a little sheep named Josh, and I told you I wanted to do a little adult story time, so I'm going to move over here, and I want to read this story to you, because it will remind you specifically of maybe you. I've got some illustrations, and you can follow along with those. But I love this story, and it's probably one of my favorite Christmas kid stories that I still read to myself every year. The Crippled Lamb by Max Lucado. Once upon a time in a sunny valley, there lived a little lamb named Joshua. He was white with black spots, black feet, and sad eyes. And he felt sad when the other lambs with snow white wool that had no spots when he saw them and he thought about their moms and dads because he didn't have a mom or dad and he felt saddest when he saw the other lambs run, running and jumping because Josh couldn't. He had been born with one leg that didn't work right. 
He was crippled. And he always limped when he walked. That's why he always watched while the other lambs ran and played. But he felt sad and alone, except when Abigail was around. Abigail was Josh's best friend. She didn't look like a friend for a lamb. She was an old cow, was brown with blotches that looked like rain puddles on a path. But her voice was kind and friendly, and some of Josh's favorite hours were spent with Abigail. But even with a friend like Abigail, Josh still got sad. It made him sad to be the only lamb who could not run and jump and play in the grass. And that's when Abigail would turn to him and say, Don't be sad, little Joshua. God is a special place for those who feel left out. And Josh wanted to believe her, but it was hard. And some days he just felt alone. He really felt alone the day the shepherds decided to take the lambs to the next valley where there was more grass. The sheep that had been in the valley so long, the ground was nearly bare. And as they prepared to leave, Josh hobbled over and took his place on the edge of the group. But the others started laughing at him. You're too slow to go all the way to the next valley. Go back, Slowpoke. We'll never get there if we have to wait for you. Go back, Joshua. That's when Josh looked up and saw the shepherd standing in front of them. Oh, they're right, my little Joshua. You better go back. This trip's too long for you. Go spend the night in the stable. Josh looked at the man for a long time, and then he turned slowly and began limping away. Never before had he felt so left out. A big tear fell from his nose and fell on a rock. And that's when he heard Abigail behind him, and she said what she always said when he felt sad. Don't be sad, little Joshua. God is a special place for those who feel left out. And the two friends turned and walked to the stable together. By the time they got to the little barn, the sun was setting, and Abigail and Josh began to eat some of the hay out of the feed box inside. Josh was really tired, so he lay down in the corner on some straw and closed his eyes, and he felt Abigail lie down beside him. It was good to have a friend, and soon he was fast asleep, and he was dreaming, and he dreamed of running and jumping like the other sheep. He dreamed of long walk, walks with Abigail through the valley. He dreamed of being in a place where he never felt left out. And then a strange noise woke him up. Abigail, he whispered, wake up. I'm scared. Abigail lifted her big head and looked around. The stable was dark except for a small lamp hanging on the wall. I think somebody's in here, he whispered. They looked across the dimly lit stable there lying on some fresh hay in the feed box was a baby. A young woman was resting on a big pile of hay beside the feed box. Josh looked again at the woman and the child and then limped across the stable. He stopped next to the mother and looked into the baby's face. The baby was crying. He was cold. The woman picked up the baby and put him on the hay next to her. She looked around in the stable for something to keep him warm. Usually there were blankets, but not tonight. The shepherds had taken them on their trip across the valley. And then Josh remembered his own soft, warm wool. He walked over and curled up close to the baby. Thank you, little lamb, the boy's mother said softly. Soon the child stopped crying, and little Jesus went back to sleep. And about that time, a man came in the stable carrying some rags, out of breath, he said, I'm sorry, Mary. This is all I could find. She said, it's okay. This little lamb has kept the new king warm. A king? Josh looked at the baby and wondered who he might be. His name is Jesus, Mary spoke, as if she knew of Josh's question. It's God's son. And then the door opened and the shepherds came in, the ones who had left Joshua behind. They were so excited. We saw a bright light and heard the angels, they began. And then Joshua, they saw him standing next to the baby. Joshua, who is this baby? Do you know who he is? He does now, said the young mother. She looked at Joshua and smiled. God has heard your prayers, little lamb. This little baby is the answer. Josh looked down at the baby 
And somehow he knew this was a special child. And this, it was a special moment. He understood why he had been born with a crippled leg. Why, he'd, why he wasn't like the other sheep. Because if he had been, he wouldn't be standing right here in this stable among the first to welcome Jesus. He looked back at Abigail and then walked close to her and took his place beside his best friend. And he said, you were white. God does have a special place for me. Amen. And we're like little lambs in the arms of our father. And he has a special place for you. And maybe that's what makes the good news so good is none of us in this place are too broken that God cannot mend whatever is crippling us. Whatever in our hearts we may feel in 2020 has wiped us out. We serve a God, like David said in Psalm 18, that can be our bedrock, that can be our foundation. And I want to close by just giving you a moment to remind yourself not just of the shepherds, but of the sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. And all we have to do is find ourselves like Josh, close to the Savior. And he truly is the one who can come in and change everything. Bring the hope, bring the inspiration, the healing. Because if you think about the good news, I look around this room and I think about our community and I think of this last season, those who are healed from addictions, those who have found healing in their bodies, those who have found healing in their marriages, those who have found hope in their finances. We serve a way maker. That is the good news. So here's my challenge. It says that the shepherds went out and told not one, not two, not a few, but they told everyone. So why are we keeping this a secret? Why are we only doing the weekend? Why are we only doing it when we worship, when we should be living the truth every second, every moment? Because we serve a God who said, no longer do we got to slaughter the lambs, but my son will be slaughtered for the redemption of your soul. And because of what he will do, you, my friend, will be with me. Lord, I'm so thankful for the good news of the gospel and salvation. I'm thankful for David's words before the Messiah even came, who declared that you are the foundation of our lives. I'm thankful for the shepherds that didn't keep it a secret, but they ran back into Bethlehem and said, do you know what's just happened? And whether people believe them or not, the truth was you gave them a message first that said, no longer will you need to go through the motions, but the Messiah is here and he will save the people from their sin. And that's where we stand today, saved, delivered, healed, filled with hope. Oh, we are so grateful, God, for the good news, the good news that promises us far more than what we can experience in this life but it goes with us to be with you forever.